Is she okay with the fact that it's, it's called Paul Smith, not Pauline Smith? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, she never wanted that. I met her at my, yeah, I think when it was my 21st birthday, studying uh, couture fashion in the Royal College in London, along with a lot of people that are now very famous, David Hockney, Peter Blake, who did the Sgt. Pepper album cover. And eventually, we, you know, we fell in love and she came to live with me. And instead of living with my mum and dad, I was, uh, I was living with two dogs, two cats and two kids and a lady from London who was very elegant and beautiful and special. She taught me about how to make clothes properly, not, not in a low cost way, but how to construct clothes because she was doing couture fashion, which means making by hand, making to fit the body. She set a, a very high standard of do things which are right, not which are easy. Hey everyone, it's Jake here. Listen, before we get going, I just wanted to drop in and say a huge thanks to all of our new subscribers. This channel is growing like crazy. And here's the truth, okay? The more subscribers we get, the bigger the channel becomes. The bigger it becomes, the greater the names that we can attract. So before you watch this video, please just spend five seconds hitting subscribe. It's good for us, but it's also great for you and it really helps grow this channel. Thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. It's great to be here. It's very posh. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But I saw you got bananas upstairs. I mean, well, the, you know, no expense spared. Listen, yeah, bananas are going to go up in price, apparently. We can't call it high performance and not provide bananas for guests. Okay? <laughs> no, that's um, true. And on that theme, what what do you think of when I say high performance? It's something that I don't identify with at all, uh, because I've never really thought about high performance apart from when I was a bike rider, you know, from the age of 12 to 18, I was a racing cyclist. So it wouldn't be high performance, but it was obviously aware of doing well. Is I don't really tend to use words like that, I don't know why. And, and work-wise, I've never ever thought about anything other than just having a nice day really and hoping to still be in business which luckily i am 54 years later so yeah. maybe um maybe high performance for you is remaining humble after everything that's happened yeah i think so with that but again n completely naturally yeah I, I work in the shop on a saturday and um in one of my shops and I, because i love working in shops and a, a lady came in last week and she said oh you're working in your shop? She said, is that to check up on people? And I said, you've got it absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. It's completely the opposite. It's not about that at all. It's about m meeting you and having a chat and somebody from Oslo or somebody from Nottingham or wherever, you know. So it's, I'm just a funny old sausage, really, you know. I've got it, I'm a bit odd, you know, because I've just, I just like every day, you know. I'm a big everyday man. We've got a lovely sentence that says every day is a new beginning and I think that's that's helped us a lot, you know. I love that phrase, every day is a new beginning. Yeah. Like, where did that originate from? Where did it just came from my that? head one day and, right. I, and I just thought, you know, I meet lots and lots of, we, we're very close to uh, students and young people and uh, from schools and, they, you know, I've got, I'd like to invite you both around to look at the building. I mean, you know, this, you know, we've got Lots of so much creativity in the building, and uh, and uh, we get lots of students come, and I see that they get really down, and they get really fed up, and they get frustrated, and so I just sort of coined this phrase: "Every day is a new beginning." So you you've had a not very good day, but tomorrow, come on, it's going to be all right. Let's get on with it. Yeah, and it is. You can turn it around all the time. Well, should we go back to the beginning? What is left sitting in front of us today? of the Paul Smith that grew up in? <laughs> Just survival. <laughs> I think keeping going right. in this bonkers world that we live in, you know, because uh, it has changed so enormously. I mean, I'm old enough to have witnessed so many sort of downturns in trade but now it's uh, it's just wars and mood and fast fashion and uh instagram and so-called celebrity and i really mean so-called what, uh, what do you mean uh, yeah so many people that are celebrities but for a year or two years and you know real celebrity with somebody who was a, a famous person for you know the stones or you know famous actors or you know that just stood the test of time you know and uh, so it's just very different that's all so it's just um it's just a ever moving target but there was something there about that example you offered paul around your admiration for 
people that are consistently good, yeah. people that are consistently able to well, just show up it's and your feet on the ground. I think it was Andy Warhol, wasn't it, who said, you know, everybody can be famous for 15 minutes, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you get your time, but, you know, what I love and I'm impressed by is continuity. And I think, right. you know, feet on the ground, still relevant, still doing nice things, good manners, polite, get on with it, you know, respect, learn to listen, learn to when to talk, learn when to listen, you know, to be interested, interesting, all those sort of cliche things, you know. And as you're describing that, that sounds to me like there's a lot of hallmarks there of your own dad. We oh, were yeah. speaking off camera, but when we were researching this, he's a he's a pretty significant figure in your life. I'd be interested in telling us about... Yeah, my dad and, and Pauline, really, and my wife, now my wife, they were the two reasons why I'm here today, really. I mean, one was my father was, you know, when you go to an auntie's house on a Sunday and, you know, you're eight and you walk in the front room and you're, like, going like this around your dad's... <laughs> thigh you know because she's like you know all oh, these cousins or whatever they're called you know and like in four minutes my dad's got more laughing you know because he would like pick out oh you seen this took this picture when i was in bournemouth and you know look at that funny bird and like, yeah. and then two minutes everybody was chilled you know so I, I hopefully i've learned that and certainly my business in japan which is quite substantial i mean i went there in 82 and there was almost no people from a different country there so uh, uh, communicating through gesture or humour or body language or learning to have very short sentences rather than complicated sentences um, <clears throat> definitely helped me grow my business. That all came from my dad, all of it. And he was a photographer, is that right? He was an amateur photographer. Um, and um, he was the uh, founder member of the Beeston Camera Club, which is just outside of my hometown in Nottingham. And he built this um, a mad uh, dark room in the attic, which was, you know, made from any wood. He was brilliant at, he had a workshop outside, you know, in the garage. And the, he, he never employed anybody to do anything, not because he was mean, but, but just because I can do it myself, you know, electrics, painting, clean out the gutters, you know, whatever. I was, I was just diverse. I mean, I, 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 when he was 92, I went to see him. And um, he died when he was 92, later in the year. But when I was leaving, I saw this thing on the wall by the front door. And I said, uh, oh, Dad, what's that? And he said, oh, don't look at that. I made myself a shoehorn because I couldn't get my shoes on. But how many people would make themselves a shoehorn? They would amazing? buy a shoehorn from Woolworths for like... <laughs> 50 pence but he'd like made one out of aluminium and bent it and cut it and and, and would he ever invite you into his workshop to oh, come and I, see the process of what he was doing yeah or uh, yeah i learned to solder when i was you know very young and and um, woodwork i love woodwork i think a lot of that was to do with my hands but the the joy was the going, going up the the ladder into the attic which was you know my mum was like <laughs> Be careful up that ladder, you know, and it was you have to hook it down with a mop or something or other. It was all very odd. And then and then working with uh, film and negatives. Hey, I just wanted to dive in and say we're so proud to be working with Manual on today's episode. And I'm so pleased to be joined by Manual's testosterone replacement therapy doctor, Dr. Manny. So what's going on when it comes to men and testosterone? About one in four men have low testosterone or are experiencing symptoms of low testosterone. Low sex drive, erectile dysfunction, low energy levels, low mood or anxiety. And how important is it, you think, if someone thinks they might have a problem for them to get in touch? The simple thing to do is one of the finger prick blood tests that you do at home. You send it back to us. We can then find out if you have actual low testosterone on blood tests. What does treatment look like? Treatment can either be with injections or with creams or gels that you put onto the skin. So those are the ways that we can replace testosterone. If you would like to know more or maybe you're thinking that maybe you might have low testosterone, then all you need to do is hit the link in the description to this show and use the code HP40. For 45% off your first at home testosterone blood test. Am I allowed to lean over a minute? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I've got my blue bag. This is my camera. This is my first camera. Uh, Kodak oh, Retinet. Brilliant. Kodak Retinet. Uh, I was 11 when I got that. So, um, Does uh, this still work? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Was that, yeah is this a gift off your dad? This was from my dad uh, when I was 11. Right. And, and the most important thing, which helped me enormously, was this, which is the viewfinder, 
which when you look through a viewfinder, if I look at you there, I've got you in full face. If I look at there, I've just got half. So it teaches, it teaches you to look and see. So this taught me to look as a designer later on in life. I realized I looked and saw. See, because that's a key phrase, isn't it? It's that Leonardo da Vinci quote that like most people look without seeing. Most yeah, they people don't see. eat without tasting. Yeah, people or... go to like France and they go, yeah, all these great pubs there. You know, no, what about the, you know, the fact that the Eiffel Tower is made out of amazing girders or, or that was the, you know, this is like, this is soft and this is smooth and, you know, this is hard and, you know, mixing, mixing rough and smooth and big and small. So, I mean, this was great. And also it's film. So now you go, you get the camp like that, take 40 pictures of your dinner for some reason. Um, uh, and, uh, and then there you... Pocket money, 12 shots. You have to really get it close, really get it right, yeah, yeah. and then wait for the film to come out, you know, uh, oh, and heavy, develop it before you knew whether they'd yeah. worked or not. One of the first things we, we mentioned was that you remain really humble. And it sounds like your parents were the same. I wonder what they, how they computed your incredible success. Yeah, I don't think my mum really ever knew what I did. Really, I mean, and then and my dad was really thrilled when I got the freedom of the city of Nottingham um, because I could take sheep across Trent Bridge. Yeah. So can you tell us then, like one of your top tips for anyone listening to this about how do you learn to not just look at something, but really see something? To remind yourself to look and see for a start. And, I mean, in this room, there's so many things that could inspire, inspire a, a piece of knitwear or anything, you know, the blue and the silver and, you know, tons of stuff. Um, and and the, the main thing is, uh, is don't just uh, go around with your eyes on, on your phone all the time. And, uh, you know, that's the, one of the biggest problems now is that we're so addicted to the, the phone that we just don't really see anything anymore. We only see these 8 to 15 seconds snaps of something that's cost half a million quid to print, to create, you know, you know a, 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 an ad campaign that costs a million quid. And then, and then what? <laughs> you know, yeah, so yeah. we don't look and see anymore. And how have you retained this? Because, you know, I've got young kids and it's magic that they can stand and look at a leaf or a stone yeah. for 10 minutes. And we don't ever do that no. because life drums that out of you. Yeah. Yet you, you still have got that almost childlike yeah. quality of seeing that's the a, magic in that, the mundane. That's the, that's the key word, childlike. If you come to my room, which I would like you to do, and bring the cameras because it's bonkers, but um, it's just full of like toys and objects and jer racing jerseys, bicycles. People walk in and say, "Oh," I say, first of all, it's not childish. It's a childlike. This room is childlike because why did somebody do do that? Why is that got that shape? Because it fits in your hand better, and that's how you. That's how you balance. That's how you balance the mug with that finger, and that's how you hold it with that finger. So why is a, a drink, a water bottle, got dimples in it? Because if you didn't, it would just slip through your hands and fall on the floor. So it's all about just looking and seeing, and understanding and asking questions. Like why is why have they done that? Kids' toys. I mean, if you've got children, kids' toys. You know, that's the hardest thing to entertain them, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, obviously you can do it with, with an iPad at the dinner table, um, but, you know, um, you can also entertain kids with a shoebox, you know, and uh, some crayons, you know. I'd, I'd like to talk about a crucial moment in your life when you were a cyclist. Yeah. And you had a crash. A true sliding doors moment for you. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. Well, I tried to stand up and the bone came through my thigh. So I thought, wow. this is a problem. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And why yeah. was that such a significant moment? I mean, why it was so uh, significant was because um, I grew up, really. Uh, I was in hospital for uh, many months. Uh, it was a hospital in Nottingham where you had a lot of people dying from coal mining, coal mining accidents. Uh, motorbike accidents and, and car accidents, which is normal in every hospital. But then it was, you know, 16 people died while I was in, you know, you'd see the curtain go round and you were like, Whew, you know. Um, luckily, humour came out uh, during that period because I the left leg was 
bound in a, a some sort of trap contraption, but the right leg was still, and I could I taught myself to pick up a spoon and eat my uh, sherry trifle with my right foot, and uh, I was nicknamed the the uh, the praying mantis by all the, <laughs> the nurses. So so. Um, even humour came out there, yeah. uh, but the, the um, obviously I missed bike riding like crazy, and my dad was so sweet because a lot of my mates were going there, coming to the to the hospital, and and um, they'd be saying what they'd done. And I I, I didn't realise, but it was really making me feel sad because I couldn't do it. And he must have had a word with them because they kept coming, and suddenly they didn't mention bike riding. So the sweet my sweet dad had mentioned that. But the key point was. Uh, there were two other people in the in the hospital. One had had a motorbike accident, one a car accident. We all got let out at the same time, and they one of them said, "Come on, let's keep in touch." We all because we used to shout to each other, and the, the key point was the fact that one of them chose the Bell Inn in Nottingham, which is where all the art students went, and so. Uh, architecture students, photography, fashion, whatever, and uh, and suddenly. This world opened up, you know. There were people. This is. I remember m meeting somebody, and the the guy said, "I'm really into Wozzley Kandinsky." Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then I just like went home and like eventually through a dictionary or something or other, or asked my dad, and they, you know, Russian artist and contemporary and amazing colours and expression through art and and then slowly I you know and they used to talk about the Bauhaus which is a you know famous German art school yeah. and I thought it was a local council estate or something like you know <laughs> the Bauhaus or something and so you learn you know suddenly this world opened up to me I thought I wonder if you can earn a living by doing something you know to do with design and one of the kids was, her dad was backing her with a little boutique and so I said I'd help her and then I started working in the shop and um, well I found the, found the premises, decorated it, did the window dressing, I had to do something called a lease. So I, I helped her out and then I worked for her for six years but halfway through that I met Pauline who was um, uh, studying uh, couture fashion in uh, the Royal College in London along with a lot of people that are now very famous, David Hockney, Peter Blake, who did the Sgt. Pepper album cover, and lots of famous people. So it was a really good time at the Royal College. She was very connected to London, a Londoner. Um, she got two children, which I didn't know at the time, but I met her at my, I think when it was my 21st birthday. And eventually we, you know, we fell in love and she came to live with me. And instead of living with my mom and dad, I was, uh, I was living with two dogs, two cats and two kids and a lady from London who was very elegant and beautiful and special and still is. And so uh, that was a big turning point. But the main thing as well, apart from the love, was uh, she taught me about how to make clothes properly, not, not in a low-cost way, but how to construct clothes because she was doing couture fashion, which means making by hand, making to fit the body, understanding proportion, like in car racing and everything, you know, getting the flow right, getting the proportion of the pockets, the opening, uh, how to put a pad in when you stitch it inside, why it creates a roll on the on the jacket. So I got real proper first class training on around the kitchen table, you know, which was brilliant. So she had an intense focus on the small things that made the big difference. Yeah, right. mother of pearl buttons in those days, which now you don't use because of climate change. Uh, yeah, you know, and the way what pad stitching does, and the pad stitching is where you stitch it inside, and every time you pull the stitch, you pull it a bit tighter, and it creates the roll. It creates the roll. If you look at a low-cost one, they press in the roll. There's no pad stitching. So, you know, all sorts of genius things that just meant that when we started our, you know, well, first of all, she said, you, you know, you've got so much energy and why don't you try and do your own little shop? And, you know, and of course, I didn't realise that shops cost the money and we didn't have any money. All her, my main income was coming from Pauline and I was earning a little bit. But then I started working on my day off and getting earned 600 quid eventually over about a three year period. And then started, um, I, I, found a, a, I found a room, which I called a shop. Yeah, because I couldn't afford a shop. And it was a room with no windows and it was 12 foot square. Can I take you back to 
one of the early comments you made. What is intriguing to me is that you said that you grew up that bike accident. Mm. You were almost like quite childlike. Yeah. And then the accident forced you to grow up. And then mm. I'm hearing about you very quickly had to assume lots of different identities. You become interested in fashion. You then mm. become a father to two young children. Yeah. You become a partner. Then you become an entrepreneur. Like there's lots of different identities that you yeah. were, that you were having to adopt. And I'm interested in how did you let go of being Paul's racing cyclist yeah. to then start to assume all these other identities? I think it was just just this curiosity I've got even to this day, you know, about uh, how things are done, why things are done, how you can do. I suppose I had a competitive spirit. I've never thought about that, really. I mean, maybe there is high performance. I just don't use those words, you know. Yeah. It just means it, it just means you were keen on doing okay, you know. And, and I mean, when Paul and I first started our business, which is, you know, we'd be here for days to explain the intricacies of doing it, but, but um, you know, it was just like, I wonder if you can earn a living doing this. <laughs> right. Or, yeah. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to earn a living doing design? So, but, but what was it about the world of fashion that appealed to you? Uh, that, I think it was having an in? idea from a blank sheet of paper and it turning into reality. It's really exciting. It's still exciting today, to, that is. You know, and just having an idea. You know, I've never been impressed by conceptual art or... Uh, because conceptual art is about ideas, but I'm always more interested in ideas. Yes, fantastic. Okay, well, how, what about turning them into reality? You know, right. as you know, with with the job you do. I mean, the, the studio, the the organisation. It's you know. So the ideas are one thing, but turning it into reality. It's so exciting. You know, if you have an idea, um, you know, in with my assistant designers now. And then you see them on somebody like a year and a half later, two years later, and it's very nice. But then there's really interesting research on this, Paul, that it, and it stems from the psychologist, the Six Cent Mahali. I don't know if you've read about his stuff of flow and the science of creativity. No, I don't know. And, no. Well, he talks about three stages, and, you, and you've really eloquently described them. He talks about, first of all, having the energy. Yeah. Then he, it's the inspiration to get the idea. Yeah but then the pragmatism to then actually have the discipline to take that idea Yeah, and, and, and not being snobby about it, you know, because in the early days, you know, I, I wanted a shop. Couldn't, I couldn't afford a shop, it turned out. But every lunchtime, I used to go down to a tailor down the road and I have my sandwich and, and watch him do the cutting and everything. And I learned a lot from him as well as Pauline. And I kept saying, oh, Mr. Hill, you know, I'm so desperate for a shop. And, you know, they're like, this rent and then the lease, I don't really get it. And he said, there's a room at the back. Call it a shop, have it. So I went out, there was this 12-foot square shop, a room, with a door down an alleyway, so it wasn't even onto the street. Um, it, he let me have it free for like three months. Then it was 50 pence, then it was a quid, I think. And, and uh, that was it. But the key thing was that Pauline and I were making most of the clothes. Then I soon realised that that actually this isn't going to work in Nottingham because it was, um, in a way, it was a bit too fashion or a bit ahead of its time or something or other. But Pauline had been to a, a, a lecture by Edward de Bono, the lateral oh, yeah. thinker, and, and, and she, he said lots of interesting things. But one of the things he said was, the job always changes you and you never change the job. So we were both thinking, well, how, how does that relate to us? And then we realised that if we were to earn a living from this room, um, we would have to change the product that's in it because people didn't really like what we got in it. Yeah. So then I decided that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'd do anything that came along to earn money right. and, not, and have purity on the Friday and Saturday. And I've taught that to so many students, you know, but if you only do you no compromise, you go bust. But if you do it balanced with some other income through photography, through being a stylist, through um, designing fabric and learn it. And then it also the joy of that was learning by doing it. But then there's something there that you're saying about, it's like that really sweet balance of having an ego to not compromise mm. 
but having no ego to be willing to do whatever yeah, it takes I, I to do Yeah, I did really it. basic jobs. I mean, you know, selling fabric and, you know, going driving in a van and, you know, or doing all sorts of things like that. Very, very down-to-earth things. But I was just keen. I, everything was a joy for me. I mean, I'm not, I must be a bit odd or something because, you know, I'd drive, like, for hours, you know, to Scotland to see if this place would make some shirts for me and they'd say no. <laughs> you drive four hours back because there's no mobile phone or yep. you know, and no sat nav or anything, you know. And you're just like, oh well. <laughs> Can we talk about the balance between you and Pauline? I'm yeah. interested. We know that you know you obviously bring hyper energy and yeah. big ideas, and she's completely opposite. So tell us about that. Balance. Yeah, <laughs> she's very shy. She's she's very at ease with her own with her with her own uh, being. Yeah, you know she's. Very at ease with silence. I'm useless with silence. Um, and she's read Isaiah Berlin. She's read uh, Sartre. She's read Proust. You know, she's just completely different to me. That's probably why it works. You know, because it, it's a balance of all the things I'd like to be, but I'm useless at. And she's, see, you know, so she can tell me a little snippet of Proust, and that'll do me. You know, rather than six books. Yeah. You know, and in the business sense, how how was that relationship? Uh, because she's she set a, a very high standard of what what that you do things which are right, not which are easy. Right. Yeah. So do things which are correct. But did you need someone to remind you? Of yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah. If I could earn a few bob, you know, then I probably would have done it because yeah. it was just in my spirit. You know. And you did very well to maintain a loving relationship. I mean, from what we can see, you seem as in love with Paul in the, yeah. the day you met, maybe even more so. Yeah. 68, you know, we met in 67. Wow. So, you know, What's the secret? That's a long time. Uh, give and take, you know, understanding both people's point of view, know when to listen, know when to talk, you know, to be interested and interesting, wash the pots. And is she okay with the fact that it's, it's called Paul Smith, not Pauline Smith? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, she never wanted that. It was never an issue. Though. No, no. And also, she halfway, you know, in the 80s, she suddenly said, I'm, I don't want to be involved in business at all. Uh, I want to just go and study history of art. And then, as a mature student, she managed to get into the Slade, Slade, of art, uh, uh, Slade School of Art oh, as yeah. a painter. She, she's dead special, you know, really special. And yeah. if she just happens to be listening to this when she's painting one day, what, what would you most want to thank her for? Uh, Keep my feet on the ground, really, and uh, you know, just continuity of love, and uh, you know, no, no ups and downs. You know, just calm. You know, the, the whole time. But you've got you've got to work at it all the time. You know. So Pauline sounds like <laughs> sometimes the advice she gives is sparing, but on point. Is there one piece of advice she's ever given you that you can still remember now? I think I think the the thing she's always reminding me is is that. Just remember what re what you really love in your work, in your business, and it's not money, and it's not expansion, or that's why the the two words at the beginning were more problem for me because it's always been having a nice day, really, you know. So uh, I mean, so working in my shop on a Saturday, designing the clothes, of course, working with my foundation, uh, helping young young people that are coming up, and so she's always been a real. Um, backer of, of all those things you know i really want to talk about how you went from that shop to where you are today and i'm especially interested in how you focus on having a nice day every day and then you manage to build a global business because i think most people think well you've either got to be a ruthless business person and expand at a rate of knots or you can be a nice person and have a nice day yeah you've managed to do both i'd love to know how well the the, the thing is it's, it's never been like a rocket you know people uh, in interviews often say when was the turning point? You know, when when did you suddenly realise you made it? You've made it, and I said never. You know, it's always been very gentle, very within our means. Never borrowed money. Always just worked very gently because the 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 goal was just to be together and enjoy enjoy life. So now, unfortunately, you guys, especially. Your age group, not you personally, but you know now there's so much, um, there's so many reference points about what you think you should do. Oh, he's got a Porsche. Oh, he's got two houses. Oh, blimey, he's he's just floated on the stock market. 
don't worry about it. You're alive. Was this ever about getting rich and having a global business? No, absolutely not at all. Never, never, never. Never. I mean, never. I mean, it's, you know, I could flog it today and get some money, but, it, you know, why, why would I want a yacht? I hate yachts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go fishing. <laughs> so was there a big plan? Uh, I wish there was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've got, I've got, let's say, 10. I mean, I've got lots of staff, but I've got 10 sort of key staff. And, uh, and right now, it is, to be frank, it's, it's tough right now. You know? yeah. So now, over the next two or three years, we will, I will have to make decisions on you know, management or money or whatever. But that's, you know, I've been in business for 54 years, so it's not bad to be in, you know, having to think that now. You did describe earlier that you do have that competitive instinct, whether that's from yeah. Your I bike think that's survival, days. though. I don't think it's really winning and losing. I think it's just that you're aware that you've got you know a lot of staff that have got school fees and mortgages, and you know, so you, your competitive spirit is staying relevant in a in a, a world called fashion where there's so much uh, utter nonsense all the time and and so many fake uh, moments because which is all to do with throwing masses of money at something um and promoting it uh and, you, and uh, it back to the longevity thing and you know whether that's you know whether a lot of people are completely turned on by the fact that they start a business it's cool they get some cash in um make it even bigger make it bigger and still cool sell it on that's what they want yeah and, it, and absolutely no problem with that at all well, but it's, it's not what works for me that's all so if we came into your studios or your offices what are the kind of behaviors come in well would love yeah, to yeah. But, but i'm interested if you would describe to us what are the kind of behaviors that we'd experience that almost captures Please and the thank culture? you so Please and thank, thank you. you. Uh, opening doors. Uh, if somebody's got a tray of drinks, you open the door. If there's rubbish on the floor, you pick it up. Um, you learn to listen. You say, um, you get people's point of view. You remember birthdays, if you can, or like uh, this, morning, this morning, the girl on reception, who's a sweetheart, she writes a little log. I, I said, oh, look, is that your pencil case? It was like brimming with... So, so I said, oh, I'll get you a new one. I've got one upstairs. I went up, found the pencil case, went down and gave it to her, and she was so thrilled. And uh, it took four minutes, you know. Don't worry about it. It's, you know, it's so easy. So you lead <laughs> so, with example, not with rules. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And how do you hire the right people to fit into the company? That's hard. Uh, that's hard, obviously, because you get you get a lot of people want to come, and it's hard in three minutes, isn't it, or five minutes, ten minutes, or whatever. you know, it's hard. But we've got a good HR department, and uh, now they've been with us a long time, so they sort of get they get what what sort of personality you want. My first member of staff in 1850 when I started <laughs> was, uh, was a zoologist. So I thought, perfect, perfect qualifications for a boutique owner. <laughs> he was with me for like 30 years. Really? Yeah. So why did you go with that? Because most people would say... He was a nice bloke. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> And he talked to me about uh, counting nudibranchs in the North Sea, and I have no idea to this day what the heck he was talking about, but I thought, he's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, then, uh, but, but then, so we're talking about your internal culture there, but as you've scaled the business, you've had to go into a business with lots yeah. of other stakeholders. And when we interviewed James Timpson, uh, the retailer, he, yeah. he... He's a very good man. Yeah, and he spoke to us how he, one of the lessons he's learned is not to do business with people he doesn't feel he could trust. Correct, absolutely correct. So I get us... offered lots of uh, collaborations, you know, with uh, with big brands, and yet mostly, you know, go back to Pauline saying, "Do things which are right, not which are easy." They say, "Well, you could make three million quid out of this," and I say, "Yeah, but I don't want to, you know, make a whatever it is a phone or that's." you know, made in somewhere or other. You know, I don't, you know, that's not true. Example, no, no, of course. But, 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 you, but you, what is your criteria for trusting somebody? Uh, well, you just, first of all, whether you like, you get on with them, you know, just whether you, you, you like their body language, the way they talk and, you know, and if it's too aggressive, then it, it, it worries me straight away, you know. 
I just, I don't feel comfortable with it. You know, if it's to do with, but we really like your stuff, uh, what you've done. I so, said, yeah, what, what sort of things? And you realise if you don't watch it, they don't really like your stuff at all. They don't, they've never, yeah. Oh, did you remember that shop I had then? Wish I didn't have a shop there anyway, you know, so, you know. <laughs> Has instinct been important then? Yeah, gut, gut reaction, instinct, body language. How do you learn to listen to that? Yeah, I don't really know. That's probably my father, isn't it? This, the world is so aggressive and so, so fast moving and you know, I think you don't need to, you, don't need, you know, you can enjoy the sunshine. Have you, did you see, I don't know if you've seen my latest Instagram picture, but there was, there's a suit I've done with all these diagonal lines across it. And that was sitting in bed one morning and the sun coming through the Venetian blind. So I just got a snap of it and it became, yeah, so... It's not, it doesn't have to be rocket science, you know, and that's just enjoying the sun. You know? I love this idea that, you, you know, you are, and I, and I feel it now, like I feel the energy sitting <laughs> here with you, the, the humour, the, you know, going off in all sort of manner of different directions. I suppose what's interesting is that's exciting and fun to be in that head, I imagine. At times, maybe it's tiring as well. But then there also has to be the things that you listen to and the things that you ignore, right? I'm wondering how you work out that's a great idea, it's going to turn into something, or actually that's just my brain keeping busy and I'll ignore that. Yeah, uh, uh, that's, I suppose, back down to instinct, isn't it? I should imagine, yeah. And also knowing what you can cope with and what you can't cope with and uh, whether it fits into what your overall theory is, really. I mean, generally, start, uh, generally speaking, we make clothes and we're interested in art. Uh, and furniture and my shop in Mayfair has art and furniture in it and all our shops have big what we call art walls and so you sort of you've got these sort of perimeters that you you know work around all the time and that's just a natural thing of things you've enjoyed over the years I think. But how do you slow down to be able to process the busy ideas of your brain that your brain's constantly throwing at you to um, discern what's valuable and what's not? Yeah. I suppose good staff around me, you know. Yeah, I've got my uh, personal assistant. She's been with me for a long, long time. She's fantastic at, you know, filtering things that I should do and shouldn't do and my diary and everything. And, and then, what's the criteria she uses to help you do that? Uh, I suppose experience of being with me for so long that she's just, you know, worked out what I like, what I what works for me and probably some of the you know more financial guys say well he don't need to be in that meeting <laughs> he don't do sums uh, yeah. is that right um probably yeah. <laughs> i don't know i just made that up but yeah probably yeah we've got these lovely mugs oh yeah um with the signature yeah. paul yeah. smith stripe yeah. let's talk then about inspiration and um is there a can you pinpoint the day that the stripes became your signature uh, it, I think it was, um, I've got, I'm going to get my bag out now, boys, if that's mm. all right, the rattle. Um, for it. The, um, oh, good, I've got apple in here. And, yeah, is that uh, lunch? Yeah, cheese sandwich. <laughs> 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 this is how we do the stripes, which is quite interesting, which is uh, I've got a piece of white card, I get a piece of white card, and then I've got drawers full of yarn, and then we, we get the yarn and wind it around the white card, and build up the build up the stripes and the reason why we do it like this is because yarn is three-dimensional whereas if you did it on the computer everything's flat and obviously if things are three-dimensional it means that that they reflect the colors reflect on each other so you can get a more accurate uh, stripe uh, combination of stripes by doing it in this very old-fashioned uh, traditional way which is called windings and I started I did um, for many years I had to use stock fabrics because we're a small business and they were always very traditional colors and then in the early 90s to answer your question um, the business was big enough to be able to do special fabrics so by doing it with this I came up with one um, combination with 28 colors in it and I thought, it looks absolutely fabulous. Uh, sent it to the uh, printers in Como in Italy, and they said, you're, you're absolutely out of your mind. We can't do 28 uh, colours. 
redo it again with 14 colours. So we did it in 14 colours and we showed it. It was a spring collection because we do spring collections and winter collections, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And it was a spring collection and it sold very well. It was a shirt, just a shirt. Then the next season, I think it was Harrods came along and said, where's that stripe? And I said, well, I just did it for spring. And they said, no, we want it again. And so we made it again for them. And then the rest, as they say, is history because it, it was so popular. It just kept being asked for every time. First of all, it was a shirt. And then it was, you know, other things, knitwear or whatever. Now we use it a lot more carefully. Yeah. Uh, we just do it all over, but we, we use it as a... A trim, really. So it came by chance, really. And was there the pressure then to recreate the magic? Like, it's only your eyes, isn't it? Yeah. That... It was just love, my love of colour, because colour is very optimistic. I mean, um, it's a, it seems a very odd thing to say when I'm sitting here in the navy blue suit. But, you know, I love colour, not necessarily for me, but uh, I love contradiction, you know, like a, the wrong socks with a, a posh suit or, um, or colour for an actor who's on the red carpet, which we've done a lot recently on, for all the awards. So you just, you know, it's just um, using things carefully. And so the stripe has been very popular, luckily. Yeah. And that's how it came about, you know. Amazing. I've probably got more magical things in here. Go on. You know? What else is in your bag? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Let's see what else. Oh, I've got some socks for you two boys. Oh, that's very yeah, kind. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Because yeah, we, we sell a few socks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's smart. We got uh, my mate David with this little naughty man poking his nose out. That's me. <laughs> Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> While this photo's out, then let's talk about your relationship with with That's David. Fantastic. When did it all begin? I suppose I always get a bit muddled with dates. When was it? Late seventies, early eighties, wasn't it? I think Bowie. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. He he just came in the shop one day in Covent Garden. And, and, and I was upstairs and then I heard all this racket outside and then I looked down, there was all these girls, you know, like on the street, you know. And, uh, and I, I rang down and said, what's going on? And I said, that, they said, yeah, they said, oh, David Bowie's in the shop. So I said, oh, that's, that's fantastic. Because I loved, you know, I loved his work. I went down and said hello and then we just slowly built up a relation, you know, a friendship. One of the lovely things that particular time was in the downstairs in our co shop in Covent Garden, there's three changing rooms in a row and a, and a mirror. And uh, my, my friend's son was 18 and he, he, uh, he wanted a, his first suit for university. So he, he, he was in the shop and he was in this first changing room like that. And he came out with a suit on to show me and his dad. And this guy came out of this changing room and looked and said, you look great. And it was David. <laughs> so, so it was David Bowie confident. coming out of this change room, looking at my friend's 18-year-old, uh, who was like standing there, and the boy went... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like he couldn't get his breath, you know. So it was a lovely story. And then David, then we just built up a friendship from there. And that, that was a, a two photo shoot, and he's wearing all Paul Smith, and I, of course, trying to get in on the act. It's a great know. photo. What did you learn from him? Uh, curiosity. He used to come, love to come in to my room I, and he used to call me Smithy and he'd say, Smithy, why, why have you got that book? Why have you got those things? Where's that from? He was always asking questions about things. Very curious, which is why he, he was a chameleon and, and uh, why he had so many different lives, I suppose, and, and, and why his words were so interesting. Yeah, because he was just a curious guy. He liked a cup of tea. Yeah, I mean, I've had, you know, I've been blessed over the years to meet lots of interesting, uh, well-known people. Yeah, Paul McCartney made me a cheese sandwich once and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, Paul Weller made me a cup of tea. And, you know, so, you know the, the, and have you seen a common thread with all these people that you've met that... Cheese and... <laughs> well, I've got to say that, yeah, yeah. it's something very pragmatic, yeah. but yeah. is there anything that you think, like... You, that you can give us a window into their world of actually this is what what I found made them special or unique. I mean, there's a lot of there's there's in all of that world. There's a lot of unnecessary ego, but the people that I tend to be drawn to, or they tend to be drawn to me, seem to be a bit more, you know, normal normal people. You know, I mean, obviously they can never be that normal because they get you know 
inundated with sure. you know, with you know people wherever they go and whatever. I mean, and some of them have just ended up just retiring and getting out of the limelight because it doesn't really suit them. You know, like Daniel uh, Day Lewis, who's a good mate of mine, and you know he's he just retired. You know, didn't didn't like all the stuff that came with having to be you know, promote movies and be out. And I suppose it's back to what Pauline doesn't like, which is yeah. inane conversation, you know. There's a really interesting concept I, I wanted to explore with you, which is called Enrove Cognition, which is, it's a, it's when I was researching this, I, it's the first time I'd ever come across the phrase. It's psychologists say that how you dress can have, can enhance how you feel and therefore how you perform. Mm. And I'm interested in what tips you'd give for us, but also for our mm. listeners on, well, How think, do you dress smartly to be, to enhance? I think, you know, obviously, the, the, one of the things as you get older, for a start, is that you shouldn't try to dress like a young person. You should dress, you know, appropriately to your, to your age and to your size as well. Um, because, you know, the, there's a northern expression, mutton dressed as lamb, you know, which is uh, means, you know, you're, you're dressing inappropriately for your, your either job, your character or age. And you should always dress for co comfort and uh, practicality, I think, you know. Don't worry too much about fashion. I mean, the bulk of what I sell around the world is very nice, easy to wear clothes that are just simple, you know. And you, because you have fashion shows twice a year, you, you have to have clothes in the show that are more attention-seeking. Right. Because if you just showed what really sold, everybody goes, you know, it's a white shirt, you know. <laughs> Whereas, so just to dress appropriately. I mean, ideally, know your character, know your job. You know, you guys presumably don't have to ever think you need to wear suits because, you know, a job is more relaxed, which is absolutely fine. You know, I personally like suits because I find them very practical. Yeah. I mean, it was mad in COVID. I actually was in my building on my own for 16 weeks and I wore a suit every day. And I, it never occurred to me that I was wearing a suit every day. I just... I was just wearing what I always wear, you know. Right. So, you know, you've got somewhere for your specs, somewhere for your keys, somewhere for your notebook and pen, which I love, notebooks and pens, and, you know, and our suits are very comfortable. They work, you know. And you were still going to work throughout COVID. Yeah, every day. You still go to work now. Yeah, every day. Every day. Yeah. You've been going for so many years. <laughs> yeah. Um, why? Why yeah. keep going? Because the alternative for me is not an alternative, you know. I don't... I, I, the only thing I can see me doing if I didn't go to work every day would be working with my foundation, which will be, you know, for the next generation. And that will be more to do with, you know, just getting energy from youth and, and giving experience to youth. But, you know, it's, you have to come with your crew to the studio and then you'll know why I come every day. Because we will. it's not, it's not, you should do another one that is just odd. That's not your typical po podcast. And, yeah, yeah. and the energy, you still have the energy. I mean, yeah, you were telling me this morning you're out of bed at five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I'm swimming the, at five o'clock. What does the day look like for you then? I swim at five, between five and 5.30 every day. Get into work around six every day, which is normally just a few of the cleaners in. My first staff, if they want to, can come in at 7.30. Um, a couple of the designers like doing that because I've got kids and they leave early. Then I norm, first thing I do normally put a bit of vinyl on. Um, Thelonious Monk, I think it was uh, uh, today, and I've got this mad new one I'm listening to is a leaf blower called Dilson De Silva. He he plays the uh, eucalyptus leaf. <laughs> so, so I've been listening to that. Really? Yeah, it's, it's incredible, <laughs> absolutely incredible. When you come, you'll hear it. Do you ever fear that you will run out of inspiration? Never. <laughs> I could keep going. It's, it's, the, it's making the inspiration turn into reality that's the hard thing. In today's, you know, very, very, um, in a world that is dominated by big brands, you know. Tell us then how you see the world and the things you're excited about, but I think also we should cover the things that, you're in pain about when it well, comes I think, to Well, I think what's so interesting, I think, and I don't know whether you guys agree with this, but there's so many big 
corporations now that there's such a monopoly in certain categories around the world of um, in fashion for sure but in other other industries and they, they it's really tough for a young creator or young studio or young director to just get the foot in the door because um, there's such a lot of power that the big brands have. I think if I was 18 again, I definitely would be disturbed more about that, you know, that the fact that that the, the world is run by 40 companies or something, probably, yeah, probably more, but, you know. So I think that's the thing uh, that, is, is disappointing, you know, the fact that being... My, when Paul and I started our business, the idea was that you had an idea in your head and your heart and you hoped somebody liked it. That was it. It was not like we're going to build a business and it's going to... Now it's... That's not... Like, you know, it's all about, you know, you get some money, you, you roll it out. Well, every you, business seems to immediately do a fundraising round yeah. Don't, within two minutes. And yeah. yet you're sitting here with this incredible legacy, never having had to do no, that. No, I know. It's don't know how. And it's a, there's a lot of fakery around as well, I think, these days. It's hard to know what to trust now. Oh, so much so. I mean, so much so, because everybody, so many people get paid to, to do things. I mean, the whole world of influence has never used to exist, did it, before? What's the risk in your world with this domination of influencers and paid opportunities? Well, it's just, it's not a risk, it's just disappointing, isn't it, really? You just, you know, you used to wear a designer because you like the designer, you know. Now, you, now do you wear it because you think you ought to wear it or do you wear it because you, you get, you're you picking up between £5,000 and half a million quid to wear it, you know. Um, and, you know, fashion shows have become like these massive events where people are flown in from a, around the world and paid for sit on the front row. And, you know, it's just, um, it's just a very different world to what I'm, I appreciate and what I enjoy. I mean, some of, the, some of the students you get in are just so great. You know, you get so much energy from them. And I think one of the joys of my foundation is that it's so such a normal, we're so normal that they can ask questions that they're scared to ask their, you know, yeah. ask other people. Is that your legacy, the foundation, do you think? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think so. So what are the key messages you teach these young people that either in your foundation or that'll listen to this about mm. how they can go and thrive and Well, you've got to know your life. stuff, you know. I mean, um, I've started this, um, uh, uh, my first big thing is this residency in Smithfield where I've managed to get six studios free of charge <clears throat> through the Greater London Authority um, and, uh, and a, a development company uh, the, where... where Six students, there'll be lots of students that apply and then six of them will get a studio free of charge for a year. So that's good, but that's not the point. The point is I'm, I've, I'm getting mentorship for them. So I've managed to get uh, lawyers, lawyers, uh, designers, uh, creative people, um, press people to uh, give their time an hour, two hours, 40 hours of mentoring in one year um, to these students because it's, the, the design bit is almost the, not, it's not the easy bit, but it's just only such a part of, it's like you guys doing this. I mean, this is just such a fraction of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. you know? <laughs> you know? Why does it matter to you to reach down and lift up the next generation? Uh, I mean, because I, I was, tw you know, when I was 21, met Pauline, and I left school at 15, wanted to be a bike rider and was a bit thick, you know. So, you know, like, nobody taught me. I thought VAT meant vodka and tonic. So, you know, so, and you know, like, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind a bit of a helping hand, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it would be cool. But how do you feel when you meet these young people that think they have all the time in the world and you're here having seen 77 years go by? Yeah. Like well, yeah, just... Keep your feet on the ground and enjoy every day and remember every day is a new beginning, you know, and just enjoy every day. Look and see, absorb, yeah, yeah, camaraderie, friendship, observation, normal things, normal things. Keep yourself fit, healthy, you know, eat good grub. Would you ever retire? 
Sorry, what's that word? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, before we finish, we've got some quick fire questions. Yeah, sure. Oh, I've got these. one more thing. Oh, to yeah, show great. You uh, um, the famous pink wall. Oh, yeah, is yeah. this the LA studio? Yeah, the LA shop. The reason why I'm interested in this, right, is because I know you're extremely modest, we've established that, but I think where you're also fantastically smart is that you understand not only the power of collaboration, but the power of staying connected to what's relevant now, whether that is people who are well-known, people who are on the up, or yeah. a store that is the most Instagrammed spot in the whole of California, even more than the Hollywood sign. Yeah, This doesn't happen by accident, no. does it? I mean, as it happens, it did happen by, <laughs> did it? by, by accident. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Tell I was us. sitting around my table in, in Common Garden with my because we design all our own shops. We've got in-house architects which you'll see if you come and it's lovely and and i remember being to going to los angeles and it's 40 miles across and every road is straight you know and this is 8660 melrose avenue or something so i thought you've got to build a sore, a sore thumb really you need something that you know because hardly anybody walks they all drive so you've got to build something that's really eye-catching the bit i was I suppose clever on is the fact I love this uh, architect called uh, Louis Barragan from Mexico, who I was aware of designed buildings that were in bright colours. So I went to, to Mexico with Pauline to look at his work, and then we built this sort of pink shoebox, which, as you quite rightly said, now is the, is the most Instagram yeah. building in, in in California. I, I noticed somebody told me that on Google, which I've now adjusted, when you go. Uh, look on Google Map. It just says the pink wall. It didn't say bloody Paul Smith. Oh, so right. it, now it says Paul Smith as well. The, Paul Smith pink wall. What I love about this though is that actually everything about it is wrong. The Paul Smith so name small. is so small. <laughs> There's no great big windows. Never would say you need windows in your store. <laughs> it hasn't got a great big glass door with a revolving entrance way, which is what everyone has these days. It's it's the antithesis of every modern store. And I would love to know how you. Where, the, where does the bravery come from to write the check to do something like this? Less is more. <laughs> Sometimes less is more, yeah. Yeah, people try too hard. Too many, too many adjectives in a sentence. It's amazing. Thank you very much. Right, quick fire questions. Yeah. The first one. The three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you should really buy into. The things that you want in your world. Bad manners, um, greed, power. Yeah, is that three? Those are the three things that you detest the most. I hate, yeah. Well, there's so much of all those things at the moment. What advice would you give to a teenage Paul growing up in Nottingham, just starting out? Uh, as, and, as, any, any teenage person, you just uh, get as much experience as you can. Work on your Saturday, doing anything. No matter, work in a pub. You know, if you haven't got the ice and the first person wants gin and tonic with ice, then you failed. It's just learn about organisation, learns about body language. One of the problems I worry about is looking at a screen all day and, uh, and that you, you, you'll you probably have a problem with eye contact and body language, you know, and uh, that's a worry. Your number one piece of advice to someone who wants to dress well? Well, don't try too hard is the main thing. You know, keep it simple uh, and, and know yourself. You know, if you've got a strong sense of humour, yes, or a strong character, yes, you could wear a colourful tie or a, a bright coloured sweater or something like that. But if you're more demure, then navy blue works. Very good. What's the single best piece of advice you've ever received and why? Give yourself time to answer a question. So take a breath. And so somebody says, oh, I've had this idea. And it's blah, 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 blah. And they say, that's really good. Uh, can I think about it and I'll come back to you tomorrow? And most of the time you say no to the idea. <laughs> What's your biggest strength? What's your greatest weakness? Uh, biggest strength? Uh, weakness is I'm not very confrontational. I'm too much of a wimp. And strength is, um, I suppose, communication, really, uh, which I got from my dad. And your final message, Paul, what's your one golden rule for living a high-performance life? Uh, keep your feet on the ground. Nobody cares how good you used to be. Wonderful. Look, to sit here 
and hear the amazing story, the wonderful pearls of wisdom. But the biggest thing that shines through is your humility. And you know that so many people are fighting to tell the world that they've got the, the answers to everything. And yeah. actually, you, what you said to us is just be a good person, enjoy the journey. Yeah. And look at what can Life's happen. Life's too right? short, you know. It's easy, just, it's so much easier to be nice, isn't it? Thank Get you, feet on the ground. Yeah, it was good. Nice, really boys. Enjoyed oh, thank that. you. Well yeah. done. Yeah. That was really, really interesting. Thank you for the socks as well. Oh, you're welcome.